Have you ever noticed how, at some point in your life, your past comes back to find you? It isn't usually ominous. It can be meeting a childhood friend grown up, a place you haven't been to in years, the veil drawn back but for a moment, so you can peer back into the past to see what once had been. This is the Spitzbrook Estate. It's located two miles outside the Kent village of Marden. It's been through many changes over the years, but the larks in spring still twitter above it as they always did. And that's not the only sound that once could be heard far above this beautiful vista. Welcome to Fields and Their Secrets. I'm Philip Day. As a lover of history, I've always imagined that every field could tell a secret, like this mammoth space you see behind me. As usual, it's just a field, harvested of its wheat crop just two days ago. But in this episode, our task is going to be to uncover an astonishing drama which played out 82 years ago high in the sky above Spitzbrook Farm, where I'm standing now. For the second time in the lives of most of us, we are at war. Eighty-two years ago, Britain is a nation at the precipice. Citizens can scarcely believe that their country, its empire and commonwealth, are once more descending into war against the same mortal enemy they fought just 25 years before. When the Germans defy Allied ultimatums after storming into Poland, the British Empire declares war on Germany two days later, along with France. After which, nothing much happens for quite a while. For the remainder of 1939, a phony war ensues, during which both sides frantically prepare for what they know will follow. Since the war began, the government have received countless inquiries from all over the kingdom, from men of all ages, who are for one reason or another, not at present engaged in military service, and who wish to do something for the defense of their country. But now is your opportunity. people sense that this is going to be a very different war from the last one. Mass aerial bombing of towns and cities is the chief concern. A few years before, cinema newsreels had revealed the ruins of Guernica, a Basque town in northern Spain, after the German and Italian bombers had finished with it. British citizens were now asking themselves what Herr Hitler and his hordes might do to London and Britain's other cities when it came their turn. Air raid drills are practiced daily in factories and schools. Anderson air raid shelters are dug into gardens. Mattresses are brought into municipal buildings so the civil servants can sleep when not working. Thousands of sandbags are filled and piled up against government buildings and cathedrals. While all that's going on, the British armed forces are being bolstered with Commonwealth airmen coming in from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa and other empire territories. 
Polish and Czech airmen also make the perilous journey to Britain after the German invasions of their countries have rendered them stateless. Even two days prior to the declaration of war, civilian Britain is on the move. One and a half million of the most vulnerable citizens are evacuated over the coming weeks from the major cities. Children six and older are parted from their parents. Brown labels are pinned to their jackets. A small suitcase with a change of clothing in one hand a cardboard box with scary rubber gas mask in the other. I remember that morning. My mother was wearing her beautiful black knee-length dress under her coat. She had on a stylish hat and kitten-heeled cork shoes. I remember her silhouette was triangular. A triangle in mourning. Dad was away training on bombers. I never saw either of them again. But as 1939 draws to a close, the massed formations of Messerschmitt, Stukas and Heinkels have failed to materialize. The feared Nazi Blitzkrieg of Western Europe is soon relabeled the Sitzkrieg, as Christmas 1939 comes and goes without major incident. But no one's under any illusions. The war to end all wars is on its way. And spring will be the time to expect it. The day Britain declares war on Germany the familiar figure of Winston Churchill is back as First Lord of the Admiralty, a position he previously held at the outbreak of World War I. In the lead up to this second war, Churchill has languished in the political wilderness, portraying himself as a lone voice, repeatedly warning of the dangers of doing little in the face of Germany's aggressive remilitarization. In fact, Churchill has been receiving clandestine briefings through a number of military and parliamentary allies. These have been as troubled as Winston by Britain's public policy of appeasement and marked lack of military preparedness. But in 1936, the Royal Air Force Volunteer Reserve had been formed to bolster recruitment into Britain's RAF in the event of war. Young enthusiastic students like this one. John William Ramshaw, known to his friends and family as Jack. My Uncle Jack was born on the 26th of April 1916. He was the eldest of three children. He had two sisters, Peggy and Jessie. Jessie was my mother. Jack's parents were Harry and Louisa Ramshaw. Harry was a plate layer in the Beverly shipyards and lived a short distance from the shipyards where he cycled there to work each day. Louisa raised the three children in the same terrace house which would be the family home until after the war. Jack begins his education at the Spencer Council School in Beverly. He's a very bright boy and wins a scholarship here to Beverly Grammar School. Motto, nourish youth and delight in old age. A contemporary of Jack's at Beverly Grammar is Leslie Pitt. Two years younger, Leslie has an aptitude for mechanics which he puts to good use after leaving school for life in the big world. Jack left school in 1934, aged 18, and started work as a clerk with the Halifax Building Society. Like many young men at the time, he dreamt of flying. He diverted some of his wages into paying for flying lessons at the Hull Aero Club at Hedden Aerodrome. He soon found himself at the controls of his very first aeroplane, a de Havilland 60 Moth. As the storm clouds of imminent conflict darken Europe, 
Both Jack and Leslie enlist for five years in the RAF Volunteer Reserve. The whirlwind of RAF training which follows is extensive and bewildering. At the outbreak of war, Jack is posted to number 13 Flying Training School at RAF White Waltham, while Leslie's destination is number 8 Flying Training School at Montrose, Scotland. Over the following months of phony war, the gruelling training continues for both pilots at opposite ends of the country. Jack spends Christmas back with his family and his fiancée Irene at Beverley, after which he's off again on his travels, this time to Scotland, for further training on Harvard's. Leslie also makes it back to his family for Christmas and to his childhood sweetheart and fiancée, Marjorie. Marjorie and, and um, Les had an amazing, amazingly strong bond. They were, uh, I suppose, childhood sweethearts. They, they would have gone to the same school in Dunswell. They would have, um, they had lots of fun together. I do know that they were, they, Les had a motorbike and they used to roar around the, the country lanes and sometimes fall off. <laughs> By the end of 1939, Leslie's training record shows him to be a very good character and a proficiency as a trainee pilot. Just over five months at number eight flight training school has turned Leslie into a fine pilot, graduating on the 13th of May 1940 with an achievement rating of over 75%. Jack's also finishing up with flying colours. For the entire month of April 1940, Jack's at number five operational training unit at Aston Down in Gloucestershire for conversion onto hurricanes. At the beginning of May, with Hitler finally poised to storm into Western Europe, Jack is posted to number 222 Natal Squadron at RAF Digby. Named after the South African region which paid for its planes, Jack's new squadron puts him through a final advanced fighter course before listing him for active duty. Jack's off hurricanes now. On May the 5th, five days before Hitler brings the phony war to an end and unleashes the long-awaited blitzkrieg on Western Europe, Jack is strapped into the cockpit of his very first Supermarine Spitfire. OK, so... Fuel on. Primal pump. Throttle. Set. Clear prop! One of 222 Squadron's flight commanders with whom Jack interacts is none other than Acting Flight Lieutenant Douglas Robert Stewart Barder. Famous for losing both legs in a flying accident between the wars, Barder has been fighting his own battles with the authorities, attempting to rejoin the RAF in a flying capacity. Proving his undoubted competence and undergoing refresher training with those tin legs, Bader joins 222 Natal, now based at Curtin in Lindsay in Lincolnshire, and takes command of A-Flight. Between the 27th of May and the 4th of June 1940, 
222 Natal is sent down to RAF Hornchurch in Essex. From this frontline 11 Group Sector Airfield, the pilots are embroiled in major actions flying cover for the Dunkirk evacuation. Jack, however, is kept back at Curtin and receives further combat training on Spitfires before he's unleashed upon the Luftwaffe. Early June, the rest of 222 returns to Curtin, and for the first time Jack now joins them on active duty. The squadron is kept busy intercepting German air raids across England's northeast, as well as breaking up enemy air attacks on Allied shipping. As I'm piecing together Jack and Leslie's movements in the lead up to the Battle of Britain, I am impressed with how much detail the RAF pays to their training. Pilots are getting shunted around the country. What seems at first glance wildly chaotic is in fact being meticulously managed. Just imagine, some pilots are not even 20. Yet here you are having passed selection, about to be let loose on the latest state-of-the-art brutal 1,000 horsepower fighter aircraft armed with eight Browning machine guns and two and a half thousand rounds of 303 ammunition. <laughs> and you're being taught how to kill the other 20-year-old before he does the same to you. One more thing. Don't break the aeroplane. They cost a fortune to build and there's a war on. Money doesn't grow on trees, you know. While Jack's at Curtin, Leslie is 60 miles to the southeast, finishing up a four-week training course on Hurricanes and Number 6 Operational Training Unit at Sutton Bridge. After which, Leslie is finally posted to Number 17 Squadron at RAF Debden, on his first active duty. 17 Squadron has 14 serviceable Hurricanes and Les is one of 19 pilots under Squadron Leader Ralph McDougall flying regular sorties as part of operations for 12 Group. End of June. Bada is posted away from Jack's 222 to take command of the demoralised 242 Squadron, mostly Canadians who suffered heavy casualties during the Dunkirk evacuation. However, July brings fierce air battles down south as the Battle of Britain commences, and newer pilots like Les and Jack kick their heels in frustration at being stuck up in Fighter Command's 12 group, away from the real action down south. The more experienced pilots, however, like Tim Vigors, the South African Brian Van Mentz, John Cutts, Hilary Edridge, and their new squadron leader, Johnny Hill, have all tasted battle down south during the Dunkirk campaign. They exchange sober glances, knowing it's only a matter of time before they too are cast back into the fray, this time with odds against them of anything up to six to one. Reich Marshal Hermann Goering has given the Luftwaffe express orders to destroy the RAF and its airfields as a top priority. This needs to be accomplished before the Germans can launch Operation Sea Lion, the full-scale invasion of Great Britain. July the 18th, Leslie is transferred from number 17 to frontline number 238 squadron in 10 group down near the south coast. No sooner has he arrived at 238's base at Middle Wallop and its forward operating base at Warmwell than Les and his new squadron find themselves right in the thick of it. 238's main task initially is flying convoy protection over the English Channel. Very quickly though, Leslie and 238 are soon intercepting bombing raids numbering hundreds of enemy aircraft per day. Thank you. 
During the first two weeks of August, the weather is depressingly beautiful. Pilots have a bit of a moan. It's typical of our English weather, but in normal summer it's quite impossible to get fine weather for one's holidays. And yet in war, when every fine day simply plays into the hands of the German bombers, we have week after week of cloudless blue skies. Two seconds, stand up! During one particularly hair-raising encounter in which Leslie is shot up and slightly injured, he downs a 109 two miles east of Weymouth before being forced to land his smoking hurricane at Warmwell with a damaged wing and punctured glycol cooling system. August the 13th, Eagle Day. The main German offensive begins against fighter command airfields. Leslie and 238 carry out five sorties that day. The fighting, a grim battle of attrition against vastly superior enemy numbers. Leslie downs a 110. Overall, 238 claims 12 enemy aircraft destroyed, three probables and four damaged. But the squadron is badly mauled. Sergeant Henry Marsh, a founding member, is missing. Three hurricanes are lost and another badly damaged. What we saw was at the same time demoralizing yet incredibly breathtaking. There seemed an inexhaustible supply of hundreds of German bombers coming over, day after day, escorted by clouds of Messerschmitt 109s and 110s. Then you see this single, long line of Spitfires or Hurricanes arcing down from a great height and, and curling around at terrific speed to strike right into the heart of the German formations. It was bloody brilliant. The expected transfer for Jack comes on Thursday, August the 29th. The pilots of 222 Natal walk out to their Spitfires, as ready and prepared as they're ever going to be for what will follow. Destination, hell, or as the Air Ministry prefers to call it, RAF Hornchurch. Again, Hornchurch was one of 11 groups leading frontline airfields. It hosted a number of Spitfire squadrons, including 222 Natal. Like Biggin Hill in Kent, Hornchurch was given a particularly nasty time by the Luftwaffe, and so too its forward operating base 20 miles to the east at Rochford. Saturday, August the 31st. Hornchurch is the target of three bombing raids during the day. Spitfires are blown up as they try taking off through the curtain of falling bombs. Still the new boy, Jack's kicking his heels at nearby Rochford. His friend, Ian Hutchinson, recalls coming off one patrol and landing at Hornchurch in the middle of a raid. I rolled to a halt and cut the engine. Beat light ground crew under their flight sergeant swarmed around my Spitfire. The Bowser raced out to refill my aircraft while the armourers laden with ammunition were reloading the guns. The noise of the explosions going on around us was terrifying but not one of those men faltered for a moment in their tasks. I was frankly relieved to be taken off again. Monday, September the 2nd. Jack is part of a nine Spitfire sortie out on patrol over Chatham, Hawkinge and Madston. No enemy aircraft are encountered. 
Jack takes part in a second patrol at midday, this time comprising 11 Spitfires which make contact with enemy aircraft bombing the airfield. In the battle that follows, several German fighters are brought down and Dornier is damaged. Unfortunately, three Spitfires are also damaged, and so for the third sortie of the day at 4 p.m., Jack has to sit this one out as his aircraft is reallocated to Brian van Nentz. Tuesday, September the 3rd. The squadron leaves Hornchurch for the forward operating base at Rochford. Jack receives word a Spitfire is on its way up from the Hamble repair factory, but it's of little comfort. Frustrated at being out of the action, Jack remains grounded at Hornchurch while the squadron proceeds to have one of the most successful days so far. At one point in the afternoon, 222 Sergeant Ernest Scott is flying an unserviceable Spitfire from Rochford, the 21 miles back to Hornchurch. When he comes across a 109 attempting an attack on a Spitfire, taking off from Hornchurch. Scott rakes the German fighter with all the ammunition left in the Spitfire, hounds the German as far as the coast stricken 109 is seen plunging into the English Channel of Folkestone. One can only imagine Jack's frustration. All the action kicking off around him and no aeroplane to fight with. While awaiting the arrival of the Air Transport Auxiliary with his new fighter, Jack gets permission to head off base to the local post office at Ingrebourne to dispatch a telegram. It's his sister, my mother Jessie's 15th birthday the following day. Jack returns to find that the ATA has delivered his Spitfire, registration K9962. Jack doesn't know it, but this fighter was used to shoot down one of the first Heinkels of the war, up near the Scottish border. The Spitfire's pilot, squadron leader Andrew Farquhar of 602 Squadron, watched as the Heinkel crash-landed in a field. Realising the crew were about to set fire to the bomber, Farquhar hastily attempted a landing in the same field to save the enemy bomber for intelligence evaluation. Unfortunately, his Spitfire cartwheeled on the uneven ground and ended up on its back, requiring the furious Scott to be hauled from his fighter by the very Germans he had just shot down. K9962 was then shipped off down south to the Hamble repair shops near Southampton. Jack looks at his watch. His crew needs an hour to refuel, check over and arm his new Spitfire before tomorrow's first sortie. It's way past tea time, so there's unlikely to be another patrol. Jack decides to carry out his own inspection of K9962. Wonders what on earth the morning will bring. Wednesday, September the 4th. Jack and 222 suit up and commence their first patrol over the Canterbury area at 8.55 a.m. No enemy aircraft are encountered and the squadron returns to Rochford. They're scrambled again at 12.35 to intercept an approaching raid. Jack and his squadron climb to 27,000 feet to gain the advantage of height over the enemy and they spot 15 Messerschmitt 109s 7,000 feet below them. 
Flight Lieutenant Andrew Robinson gives the order to attack, and Jack and the other 11 Spitfires of his patrol peel off and dive down like a spear into the enemy. An hour and a half later, by 10 past two, the squadron has returned, this time to home base at Hornchurch. Five 109s are claimed destroyed in the battle, but three Spitfires and their pilots have also failed to return. Their pilot officer, John Carpenter, flying officer, John Cutts, and my uncle, Sergeant Pilot, Jack Ramshaw. 11 days later, on September the 15th, in what will become Battle of Britain Day, 238 Squadron becomes embroiled in a huge air battle over Kent and Surrey. And Sergeant Pilot Leslie Pidd also fails to return. I want to get a clearer, more detailed insight into Jack and Les, so I'm taking a trip the 190 miles north to Yorkshire to find out where it all began. I'm looking forward to meeting two of Leslie Pitt's relatives, Jill, Leslie's niece, and Nick, Les's great nephew. They've sent me down photographs to provide some background to the family. Les's father is George Richard, and this is Les's mother, Hilda. They have five children. Hilda Gladys is the eldest, Nick's grandmother, then Enid, followed by the three boys, George, Stanley, Jill's father, and the treasured youngest, Leslie. Les's father was a World War I hero of the British Merchant Navy. George Richard was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal in May 1917 for his part in operating a 12-pound gun from an exposed position to shell a German U-boat attacking their ship off the Irish coast. No prizes for guessing where Les gets his inspiration from. Most of this long journey will be on Britain's longest road, the A1. Originally known as the Great North Road, King Harold of England famously took this route to march his army north to annihilate a huge Viking invasion force at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. Modern warriors like Jack and Leslie, facing the prospect of another invasion, would have been very familiar with the A1. Here's what it looked like in 1939. And this is what we've ended up with today. Here we are. Beverly, the county town of Yorkshire's East Riding. Beverly inspired the name of the town of Beverly, Massachusetts, which in turn inspired the name of Beverly Hills in California. Hmm. Jack and Leslie would have been very familiar with these streets, walked them often. Jack worked at the Halifax Building Society between leaving school and joining the RAFVR. Jack and Irene would have shopped here most weeks, gone to pubs. The same with Les and Marjorie on their motorbike. Beverly was home. And this is what remains of Beverly Shipyard where Jack's father Harry worked. Beverly's former shipbuilding industry was prolific, employing up to 650 people at one point. Between 1884 and its eventual closure in 1977, 
Beverly Shipyard built and launched literally hundreds of trawlers. I meet up with Nick and Jill at the ship inn at Dunswell for a spot of lunch and a chat. The two cousins haven't seen each other for a while and catch up on news. Jill's father was Stanley, one of Les's older brothers, who joined the RAF to bring his skills to bear on ground crew operations. It, it was a RAF time served um, aircraft mechanic. Yeah. Very good at his job actually. Yeah. And, and, and tiny. He worked for Bruff, didn't he? Yeah, it, yeah, and he worked on those Beverly the Beverly aircraft because mm. because they used to send him down the wing because he was so tiny. <laughs> <laughs> All the pids were tiny. My granddad was that like, made them useful, right? <laughs> <laughs> but he was very good at the at the job as well. Okay. Nick's detailed research reveals what happened after the mauling Leslie's squadron suffered facing down continuous heavy enemy air attacks over the south coast. On 14th of August, after a month of continuous operations on the front line, Leslie and 238 were moved to St. Evel in Cornwall for a brief respite. But it turns out St. Evel isn't going to be quite the rural backwater the Air Ministry was banking on. Six days after 238 arrives in Cornwall, three Junkers 88s bomb the base damaging two hangars and wrecking three Blenheims. 238 Hurricanes manage to shoot down two of the enemy, but the Germans don't get the message. On successive days, the Luftwaffe returns, dropping high explosives and incendiaries in a series of unsuccessful attempts to wipe out the base. We believe it was during this time that Leslie is given a few days leave to return home to see family and loved ones in Dunswell. Leslie and his brothers and sisters grew up here at cottage holdings in the village of Dunswell. Such small holdings were built to house ex-servicemen like George Richard, who had served with distinction in the First War. The property boasts three acres upon which the family farmed fruits and vegetables and reared animals. In the third week of August, after an exhausting journey north across the country, Leslie returns home here to another world to celebrate his recent birthday and to see his fiancée and childhood sweetheart, Marjorie. I'm pondering the agonizing few days it must have been for everyone. Far too brief for his loved ones and for Les, a fleeting, almost cruel respite in the familiar, comforting embrace of his family only to have to return down south to rejoin 238 and get back into the war. His niece, also called Marjorie, recalls what happened on the morning Leslie departed. I was about three and a half or something like that and I couldn't understand why everybody was sad. But he'd obviously told them that he didn't think he was going to make it much longer. He'd rode his luck. And he left the following morning so I followed him out and waved to him and he came back and kissed me and said goodbye and he was gone. June 2020. The Martin History Group meets following the lifting of lockdown during Covid. Among the business discussed 
Chairman David McFarland produces a letter he has received from a Mr. Tony Berryman. In his letter, Mr. Berryman states that he's trying to uncover more information about his uncle, a Spitfire pilot whose aeroplane came down near Marden during the Battle of Britain. David McFarland hands me the letter. It mentions my father and my grandfather. Curious, I call Tony Berryman and we have a fascinating conversation and agree to meet up for a chat. Philip, your, your grandfather, Captain James Day, wrote to my grandparents, Harry and Louisa Ramshaw, a brief letter on the 28th of October 1940, giving details about Jack. It invited them, if they so wished, to ask for further information, and of course they wanted further information, and on the 7th of November 1940, uh, your grandfather wrote a very detailed, long letter, seven or eight pages, uh, to my grandparents, giving a great deal of information about Jack. Tony's mother, Jessie, is reluctant at this stage to share the letters, since the loss of her brother still grieves her. Jessie was 15 at the time of the tragedy, and quite understandably would rather the letters were not released. Jessie later married and became Mrs. Berryman, and she has lived a long and full life with Jack's memory, and is now in her 95th year. I'm also interested, Philip, in finding out more about your grandfather, who I understand was a, a pilot in the First World War. Yes, uh, James was 20 years old when he was sent out to France with very little training to fly night bombing missions over the front. Inconceivable even to pilots of the Second World War. The FE-2Bs my grandfather flew consisted of nothing more than plywood and canvas stretched over a tubular steel frame. Bombs were tossed over the side or released from primitive racks. Dangerous work, freezing cold fog, all done in the dark. James flew 50 missions, which included attacking Zeppelins, for which he was awarded the Military Cross and the French Croix de Guerre with Palm. So you're retired now. Can I ask what you did for a living? I was a pilot and still am. Fly anything interesting? 87 different types over 51 years, quite a few different types. Commercial most of the time, last uh, 24 years with British Airways as a captain, last uh, eight years as a captain on the uh, Boeing 767 flying uh, long haul routes out of Heathrow. And um, what are you doing now? I'm the Chief Flying Instructor for Flight Sport Aviation at Deanland in East Sussex, so my career has come full circle from starting off with light aeroplanes to finishing with light aeroplanes. Do you have any idea what your total flying hours are? I do. Um, to date, 29,300. Quite a high figure, uh, which equates to about 3.3 years in the air. No prizes for guessing where the inspiration to become a pilot could have come from? Not at all. Most certainly, uh, as I grew up, my Uncle Jack's photograph was in the family home, and both myself and my cousin Ian, who was a grand engineer with the Royal Air Force, took the inspiration most certainly from my Uncle Jack. Tony and I have agreed to collaborate in order to find out exactly what happened on Jack's second patrol on that Wednesday, September the 4th, 1940. Surviving RAF documents indicate that Jack and 11 other 222 Spitfires depart Rochford at 12.35 and are directed down into Kent and onto a staffel of Messerschmitt 109s, 7,000 feet below them, near Maidstone. The mother of all air battles ensues the classic confrontation between Spitfires and Messerschmitts. Five 109s are later reported shot down, but Jack and two others of 222 have failed to return. Flying Officer John Cutts has been shot down over Chart Sutton and killed. Pilot Officer John Carpenter, after destroying a 109, is banking away when he's blown clean out of his cockpit, most likely by British anti-aircraft fire. Carpenter parachutes down and survives with injuries. What can you tell me about the circumstances surrounding Jack's crash? I mean, what, what do we actually know for sure? Well, we know, Philip, from eyewitness accounts from your grandfather that the engine had failed. The aircraft has been uh, gliding down with a dead engine. We know that he's been pursued down to ground level, 200 feet, in fact, by ME 109, who was constantly firing at the aircraft. Uh, which would have distracted Jack trying to attempt a forced landing, which he had practiced many times before during training. And of course, I'm tempted to ask, why do you think Jack didn't bail out? I mean, it was a sitting duck, he was in a, you know, with a dead engine. 
Well, if we assume that the engine flame at 20,000 feet and the Spitfire was gliding down, but the Messerschmitt didn't see that until maybe 10,000 feet, Jack's idea would be to do a forced landing. A 24-year-old trusted with this brand new aeroplane, a very valuable aeroplane, perfectly reasonable that he would attempt to do a forced landing, which he'd been trained to do. Things changed, of course, when the Messerschmitt got on his tail. Setting up the aeroplane for a forced landing is one thing he'd done many times before under training, uh, but very difficult to do when somebody's shooting at you. Amid all my questions, Tony has one of his own. He wonders whether it's even possible at this late stage, 82 years after the battle, to discover the identity of the Luftwaffe pilot who shot down his uncle. Over the next few days, I get busy. I contact the owners of Spitzbrook House and also the landowner of the surrounding farm. I explain about Jack and what we wish to accomplish with the project and ask for their permission to film. Both are very interested and kindly give their consent. In between dog walks, I'm following up on that question of Tony's about whether the Luftwaffe pilot who brought Jack down can be identified. I'm also gonna run the same exercise with Leslie, who failed to return on a sortie during that huge battle which occurred over Kent and Surrey on the afternoon of September the 15th, 1940. For this, we're gonna need some specialist help. So I'm turning to Battle of Britain expert, Simon Parry. Simon has compiled what must be the most definitive day-by-day -day combat reports on the battle making use of a huge trove of surviving documentation. Simon's been of invaluable help on previous projects, so I've sent him an email in the hope that he can provide us with a list of Luftwaffe victory claims for that part of the day. Tony and I have nominally set the period between 1 p.m. and 1.30, commencing with the time Tony says Captain James, as an eyewitness, first became aware of the raging battle in the skies above his farm. Have you ever noticed how, at some point in your life, your past comes back to find you? It isn't usually ominous. It can be meeting a childhood friend grown up, a place you haven't been to in years, the veil drawn back but for a moment so you can peer back into the past to see what once had been. Here's the plat where Jack came down. As the teenage son of a farmer, I harrowed and rolled this field. I combined it. I've always loved the plat. It's just immense. Back at the time of the Battle of Britain, though, the plat looked very different. It was a patchwork of orchards in differing stages of maturity, with hop gardens at the farm end. Jack came down here, just 20 to 30 yards from the field's edge. This would not be strange if Jack and his Spitfire plummeted to earth in a fiery, uncontrolled descent. But Jack actually crash-landed here on top of an orchard. A few days later, Tony calls with the best of news. His mother, Jessie, has kindly given permission for the letters to be shared for the film. The same day, I receive an email back from Battle of Britain expert, Simon Parry. It contains a surprisingly long list of Luftwaffe pilots who registered claims with their superiors for Spitfires and Hurricanes shot down between one o'clock and 1.30 p.m on the afternoon of the 4th of September. Simon rightly cautions us not to jump to conclusions. In the fog of war, everyone's claiming whatever they can, and the times could be out. Still, Tony and I are intrigued by the list, so we've decided we're going to run a little exercise. By discarding those claims outside the Spitzbrook area, all the while keeping within our 30 minute time frame, we narrow the list down to 12. Just as we're wondering how we can whittle it down further, 
Simon emails over this graphic, taken from volume 10 of his combat archive. It identifies the Luftwaffe Staffel Jack Squadron attacks. Yad Geschwader 77. So now we separate the JG 77 pilots from the list, and we're left with four candidates. Out of these four, I'm discarding Keitel and Mitherich, as their claims are on the extreme end of our time frame. We're left with Oberleutnant Herbert Kunze and Feldwebel Friedrich Müller effectively a second lieutenant and a sergeant pilot. That evening I run internet searches on both pilots. There's not much on Kunze, not even a photo. But I do turn up something intriguing on Merla. This ten-year-old forum post by a collector named Barry in New Jersey, USA. I recently acquired the Verpas and documents of Feldpavel Frederick Murder, who served with number two, JG 77, from the 9th of March to the 30th of November, 1940. He flew 208 combat missions against England, but only had two victories. I would be thrilled if someone could identify the two Spitfire pilots who murdered down. I contact Barry, explain what we're up to, and he very kindly emails over Merla's documents. So, here's what catches my attention. Merla flies 208 combat missions and has only two victories. The first kill of Merla's career is a Spitfire on the 4th of September. Now, there's no reason why that couldn't have been John Cutts or even some other Spitfire that afternoon. But in the absence of further corroboration, we're looking for a Luftwaffe pilot who has the motivation to do something unusual, reckless, namely to break out of a fight four miles up, leave his squadron, and hound a damaged Spitfire which can't fight back, all the way down to the ground in its doom. I can't prove any of it, but the fact remains that when Merla left his base that morning, He's already flown a ton of missions, but has yet to score a victory in his Luftwaffe career. So, Tony, I've spent a couple of evenings going over um, whether it's Müller or Kunze, mm -hmm. and I'm not getting past the idea of an Oberleutnant breaking off a combat at 20,000 feet to follow a crippled Spitfire all the way down to the deck. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is going to be a sergeant pilot who hasn't yet got one on the board. So, in my view, it's Müller as the trigger man. And not only that, this is a very risky manoeuvre because he's coming down to 200 feet. So he's got to run this gauntlet of ACAC stations and Brent stations all the way back to the coast, mm. on the deck basically, because mm. he doesn't have the fuel to get back up to 200 Absolutely, he can't feet. afford to burn the fuel climbing back up to high level to well, get back home. What's your assessment? Um, I totally agree. I think um, Muller, uh, a very experienced wingman, we know he'd flown 208 combat missions, he'd watched his, wing, his leader uh, involved in combat, and so on this occasion I firmly believe that he had separated from the leader, maybe at 15,000 feet over Kent, and then Muller saw this Spitfire gliding down Took and thought, chance. let me get that one. Yeah. We have to say, we can't be dogmatic about this, no. but I think this is as close as we can get really. And the Times do fit in with your grandfather's letters, yeah. and there's a good motivation for Muller in what we have just discussed. What are you up to, Jack? That would finish you up over the other side of this field. Jack's attempting a forced landing. He would have known from the briefing that morning that the wind was moderate south-southwest. So in spite of the enemy harassment, he spots a meadow and lines himself up. He just needs to keep air under the wings long enough to make it to the meadow.
from James Day, Captain, Spitzbrook, Marden, Kent, 7th of November, 1940. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Ramshaw, I must admit that at first I hesitated to try and find you. I was so afraid I might cause you even more pain than you had already suffered. However, I considered it my duty to do so, and so wrote to the records officer, RAF. You of course are well aware that the aerial fighting over this part of Kent has been almost continuous since the middle of August, especially during September. On September the 4th, at around 1 in the afternoon, a very big battle was in progress in this district at a great height, when I saw one of our Spitfire machines, which has since proved to be your son's, losing height rapidly. It was soon evident that he had trouble with his machine. I then noticed that he had a dead engine and was endeavouring to get out of the fight. But to my disgust he had been followed down by a Hun, who was attacking him at intervals, when he was flying a machine over which he had no control to fight back. This of course is the opinion I formed when watching the whole time. I have no proof. The wretched Hun kept it up to within 200 feet of the ground and I am proud to say that your son stuck to his machine in spite of all of this in an attempt to save it by landing it, when of course I take it he could have jumped when higher up. The country around here is bad for forced landings, being orchards and hop gardens to a large extent. He eventually had to try and get his machine down in one of my orchards instead of an adjoining meadow, his judgment having been clouded by the constant attacks. It is only natural the crash was unavoidable, and I regret to say it was a complete crash followed by fire. But most fortunate, the two men who arrived first were able to get your son clear of the flames. I was there almost immediately, and we did our best to make him as comfortable as possible, although he was then unconscious and he did not speak again. A doctor and ambulance were soon there, and I assisted the doctor, and he informed me that the injuries were such that there was little to be done. He was carefully placed in the ambulance, and I think I am correct when I say that he passed away before reaching Maidstone Hospital. I am pleased to say that although the crash was a bad one, his injuries were not so bad, the fatal one being at the back of the head, which was sustained in the crash. I am confident that he had no serious wounds from the fighting, in spite of the merciless attacks made upon him, that he died trying to save his crippled machine. Eleven days after Jack comes down at Spitzbrook, the Battle of Britain reaches its peak. Three attacks are launched by the Luftwaffe, the first at 10 a.m., then a huge raid at 2 p.m., and yet another later in the day against the Supermarine Factory at Woolston, near Southampton. Sergeant Leslie Pitt and 238 are scrambled out of Middle Wallop in Hampshire and directed east to intercept the huge enemy formations. They clash with the enemy over Kenley, south of London. Churchill himself is watching the action from the Uxbridge Operations Centre in West London. This is the historic moment when he's told that every available RAF fighter is now airborne, with no reserves left in the the battle that follows involves over 600 aircraft and is brutal and unforgiving. Leslie and his squadron become embroiled in constant action against KG-53's bombers, which are tightly protected by hordes of 109s and 110s. 
By 2.45 p.m., three of 238's hurricanes are so badly shot up, the pilots are forced to abandon the fray. Leslie abruptly finds himself alone in a sky filled with German aircraft. There's initial confusion over precisely what happens next. We were outnumbered about four to one. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the, the 110s and the 109s got in one another's way trying to shoot at us. According to one RAF pilot, Leslie is shot down and bails out too low. Another is certain Les bailed out over Tunbridge Wells before being strafed by an enemy fighter while descending on his parachute. In fact, Leslie never bails out at all but stays with his stricken aircraft. He is killed instantly when his hurricane plunges into an oak tree in the scenic grounds of Kent College at Pembury, just outside Tunbridge Wells. In this book, The Kent College Saga, in which author Margaret James traces the history of the exclusive Kent private school. She writes, In the early months of the war, when the school was settling into its new home, all was calm and peaceful. But with the fall of France and the evacuation from Dunkirk in June 1940, most of the girls went home and the prize giving and other events were cancelled. Term started in September as normally as possible with further reduced numbers. It was then, at the time of the Battle of Britain, that the reality of war touched the school most closely. A British hurricane was shot down in the grounds by a German fighter. There are painful memories of the screaming noise as the plane descended. The inimitable Miss Barrett, matron for many years at Folkestone and Pembury, was the first on the spot, and it was she who picked up the shattered remains of the dead pilot and covered the body in a cloth before the stretcher bearers arrived a little later. Leslie's battle against Nazi tyranny and his own life ended here, in this beautiful glade, six miles from where Jack came down on my family's farm at Spitzbrook. And this spot is not even 50 yards from a future building that would become my own daughter's classroom at Kent College. Simon Parry has just sent over the Luftwaffe victory claims for Les Pid's final sortie during that large raid in the afternoon of September the 15th. Will it even be possible to isolate the Luftwaffe pilot who brought Leslie down? We can discard the Spitfires and concentrate just on the Hurricanes and we're looking for a time around three o'clock to their Kulenstendel. Uh, that's two there. Again, no locations for them, but times early, too early. Gertz, Hurricane, again, too early. And then we got this guy down here, Hurricane, no time. And then there's this one, Oberleutnant Hermann Steger, Hurricane, Tunbridge. Hermann Steger looks like our man, but I'm mindful again we can't be dogmatic, everyone was claiming everything. So I ask Simon if it's possible to find out whether more than one hurricane was brought down in the Pembury Tunbridge area, especially around 3 p.m. While I'm waiting, I do a search. Oberleutnant Hermann Steger is certainly not a difficult man to track down. He's a famous Luftwaffe ace who was one of the few start to finishers who survived the war with 63 kills. He even has his own Wikipedia page. Steger shoots down seven aircraft during the Battle of Britain, flying 109s for Yardgeschwader 51. Simon gets back to me with Steger's full victory list for the war. 49 victories on the Western Front, and 14 on the Eastern Front. 
Number nine is a hurricane Steger shoots down over the Tunbridge area during the raid. Tunbridge was well known to the Luftwaffe for its Arrow Strait railway line running east-west for 45 miles, so accuracy in reporting a kill would not have been a problem. Simon also informs me that the records show that the only hurricane brought down in the Tunbridge area during the afternoon raid of September the 15th was Sergeant Leslie Pidd flying Hurricane P-2836. Seven decades on, a 12-year-old Kent College pupil, Victoria Vizard, investigated Leslie's story and compiled a detailed project about him. The school arranged a memorial day and Leslie's family was invited down from Yorkshire as guests of honour to mark the occasion. The date? September the 15th, 2010, the 70th anniversary of Leslie's death. It got out to the local media channels what was happening and this was to do with the memorial. The BBC got in contact with us, ITV also got in contact with us and some other news channels. And they, they came to the school and they did some interviews with me. It was all very interesting for a 12 year old. <laughs> Hadn't really done that before. On the big day, the girls are just getting settled in when a distant roar grows louder. was actually designed by a sixth form member of the school and she did it as one of her projects. Her name was Maisie Walters and she did a wonderful job, beautiful job, and the art department had it installed. Victoria's father is Battle of Britain historian and world-renowned Spitfire restorer Stephen Vizard. Well, following Victoria's interest in the hurricane, we wanted to try and get a licence for the site from the MOD who have to give these things out supposedly and so once that came through we went into the woods found the site and carried out a excavation it wasn't very deep it never was i mean it was only perhaps sort of five six feet down originally when it crashed and when they recovered the the aircraft and, and leslie's remains but obviously there were some bits and pieces left um, which we were lucky enough to find this is a, a very battered valve from the rolls royce merlin engine we have a couple of pieces here, which is very difficult to discern, but uh, there's part of the, the Rolls-Royce that was um, embedded into the rocker cover down each side. You can just see par partial bits of the, the lettering there. Um, this is a piece of the instrument panel that Leslie would have been looking at. This is where one of the instruments would have been located. And we have a fairly large piece here which is a, a piston liner again from the engine where this is just would have been a cylindrical liner with the piston on the inside. This is a bracket that goes on to the wheel one of the landing gear wheels on the aircraft and there's a pin that goes through this piece which holds the wheel up into the aircraft wing in, into the locked and up position when it takes off. And here we have actually um, a piece of wood, which is from the propeller. The propellers were made of a laminated mahogany type blade. And this is a piece of wood that, uh, that we found there, uh, basically almost at the bottom of the hole. And this piece <coughs> is quite a significant piece. It's the top of the oxygen supply tap that goes into the bottle. Um, and Leslie would have actually where the Bakelite top has, has gone, but that's where the on-off um, rotating 
knob would have been when he would have turned his oxygen supply on when he took off that day. Um, and this would have fed into his mask. Um, so that goes into the bottle. This feeds through to his mask and this is the supply tap on and off. And generally a selection of other pieces of wreckage. Not very much there, but um, enough to represent the, the aircraft. And obviously um, at some point these will go on display somewhere as a, as a tribute and a memorial to Leslie. 82 years ago today, almost to the very hour, on the 15th of September, Leslie Pidd's hurricane came down in the woods at Kent College. We have a remembrance service every year where the students really look at Leslie and the sacrifice that he paid uh, to the country and uh, we use the story as an example to bring the history of the war alive and to keep it in the memory of the students. I'll always think about his bravery and his sacrifice and everything that he meant to me. He's like a brother to me. I've never met him. He's, he's like a brother. pilots who flew Spitfires and Hurricanes in August and September are in my humble opinion the greatest heroes this very dear country of ours has ever known. So I think the lesson we can take from both Jack and Leslie's story is that freedom is not free and there is always a price to pay.